recorded. So if you do not want to be recorded, um, please, first of all, shut off your camera and then set your name to something that's anonymous. Um, second, um, because of the large number of people that are here, the response has been beyond overwhelming. Um, the primary means with which participants will chat with, interact with the speakers will be through the chat. And we are going to come to you frequently during this presentation to bring you into the chat. So, I mean, to bring, to bring in your opinions. Um, but so please remain on mute um, unless you're one of the speakers. But otherwise, um, even though I'm asking you to mute yourself, please, please interact. We want to hear from you. All right. Which brings me to the first time I want to hear from you. As I said, you're going to be asking you to chat with us frequently. And we're going to start off this session by talking about getting you, I mean, excuse me, to interact with us immediately. And this is the future question that everyone seems to be asking. Everyone has an opinion on it. And so we want to get yours. What do you think will be the long lasting impact of this pandemic? Again, what do you think will be the long lasting impact of this pandemic? What will be the long lasting impact of this pandemic? Higher standards when it comes to work-life balance and offerings from employers. It won't matter where you are, you'll be able to participate. Remote work and learning. Other people's thoughts about this one. Less commuting. Gradual fading of the face-to-face -face experience. Other thoughts about what's coming up? Increased use of technology by all ages, absolutely. Um, larger labor pool, people can live and work anywhere. Um, more use of technology, LMS, and more access for students to take courses. Physical presence, um, more people having online experience, absolutely. Anyone else wanna weigh in? What will be the long lasting impact of this pandemic? Opportunity to truly address inequities. Yeah, I think there's, one of the things I know in all of these responses, there's a hope for a greater opportunity and um, greater balance. And there's, a, there's an optimism in these responses, which I think is really nice. And then Margaret, more bifurcation as it's privileged just knowledge workers and almost, a lot of optimism and then there's that one comment but this is a comment that margaret and i have talked about frequently um so what we're going to do today is actually talk about the impact of technology in a number of different areas and we're going to actually look at four and the way each of these discussions is going to work is first we're going to look at i'm going to ask for your opinions and then i'm going to turn to our panelists and ask each of them to share their thoughts on that particular a single thought. They may have multiple thoughts on that particular technology and its impact. And we'll do go through, time permitting, we'll go through four different areas, including such things as um, analytics, artificial intelligence, and one area is like whatever we didn't think of. So um, we're going to get started. And in the process of this, I will be introducing our panelists. So the first question for all of you is, how can we expect learning management systems to evolve after the pandemic? Will they evolve into learning experience platforms or is that just marketing terminology? So I'd like to see, hear your thoughts on this particular issue to get started. I see that there's some comments on my mic. Can you all hear me now? Okay, I must have just sat in the wrong place. AI propelled LMS is one. Can you elaborate on that? Sorry, my mute was not coming out. So uh, thinking that the LMS will move from tracking data okay. to a uh, mode in which artificial intelligence will uh, make sense of your data and create patterns and advise you on your next career movement. Um, in terms of what will be required in the organization, what options can you opt for 
based on what you have already learned and the experience you had at work. So it will be kind of an advisory um, artificial intelligence unit instead of just an LMS. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying the comment. All right. Um, most people are not making any comments about this, except for one. Um, it all depends on how pedagogy changes. The present LMSs are underutilized in terms of the feature set as they have it. Um, thanks for that one. Well, I want to turn it over to our panelists, and we're going to start off with uh, Matthew Giorgio, who is representing the entrepreneur or the business point of view, and he's a multiple entrepreneur, they're serial entrepreneur is the technical term, um, and he's the founder of several firms, including Media Sparks. And Matthew, I want to, and he's coming to us, I might add, from Halifax. Um, Matthew, turn it over to you. Thank you, Saul, and thank you everyone for uh, coming here today. So I'm um, focusing on LMSs. I, I like a, a couple of the comments that uh, we've just heard uh, uh, Brian mentioned that you know the current feature set of most LMSs are just not being utilized because I think uh, a lot of institutions and courses are still using very old school methods. So I think that's a very astute observation is that unless uh, educators are ready to use these advanced features, having them available may not be that useful. Uh, so I think that's a great observation. I also like uh, uh, what Juan was saying, and I agree with it, in that um, there's going to be a better assessment of learner performance and skills and competencies and recommendations on what to do next. And maybe those recommendations will open up to external uh, courseware and other experiences where you can uh, ultimately get that extra, extra knowledge and skills that you need. And I think ultimately it's all gonna go to uh, uh, micro-credentialing. I think that's really where the future of learning is headed and LMSs, I think, are going to, if they're not already there, they're going to move towards uh, supporting micro-credentials by doing better authenticate, uh, better validation uh, of assessment and uh, credentialing. And I think you'll see uh, open credentials and on the blockchain, and those types of things. Anyway, that's my one minute, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, next, I want to introduce Jason Tam, who is filling in today for Anne Hill Dewin, who unfortunately is not able to join us. Jason is an assistant professor at Texas Tech University, um, where the weather is considerably warmer than it is here in Canada. Jason, turn it over to you. Uh, sure. So I come, um, I come from a faculty perspective here, and I, I feel like, um, yes, the, there's uh, not enough use, good use of LMS features right now. Um, I think part of it is the um, the non-integration with the technologies that we're using to deliver our instructions today. Like, you know, here we are in Zoom, but I feel so separated from the learning modules and the systems that are containing those content for my students. So the juggling back and forth between multiple platforms and technologies could be a challenge, I think, for, for instructors and for students as well, right? Um, and I'm always thinking about accessibility and perhaps we can touch on that um, in a little bit too. I think this pandemic situation has opened up a new world for students to experience learning and as well as challenges right that um, that might affect their experience and how can instructors be more accommodating and be aware of these challenges through this kind of modality i think that is very important and i can share more about my own personal experience later on if we have the time but that's my two cents thank you and next, I'd like to introduce Stephen Downs from the National Research Council and probably one of the best known names, not just in Canada, but in the world in e-learning. Stephen. Who is muted? Sorry, the uh, thing opens up in full screen and it made my mute button hide way down in the corner. The perils of living with technology. Hi, everyone. A um, couple of things. I'll start off with what Matthew said about changes in assessment and, and micro-credentials. I think some interesting developments will occur there. Maybe not right away, but I think they're starting already with automated assessment and AI recognition of uh, performance. A lot of the infrastructure that we have now for testing and credentialing is gradually going to move to the background. And again, we're seeing this already as people are embracing online learning. Um, learning experience platform is a thing, 
Um, so it's not just marketing, but we need to understand what kind of thing it is, right? Um, the idea of a learning experience platform is that what we formerly called the LMS now operates as a platform, which means that it's providing access to other applications and other their services. So the idea here is, you know, as Jason, you said, people are bouncing around from place to place. Very annoying. Totally agree. The learning experience platform is supposed to provide a seamless integration so that we would come from the learning environment into a chat like this. We've seen the need for that over the last two years. And as people go back to more traditional experiences, they'll be sort of going, where was that good stuff that we had during the pandemic? Uh, but it's going to depend on distributed services, something like a blockchain identity, et cetera. Longer term, probably looking at doing less formal classes overall, because we won't need to, and putting the learning right into the place where we need it. And again, as more and more work moves to remote environments, online environments, distance environments, we will want the learning and the thing that we're doing to be right there in the same environment. The LXP provides the infrastructure for this, at least from the perspective of an institution. But I think what we really want in the longer term are products and services that provide this learning for us instead of schools and institutions. They'll still be operating in the background, but they won't be at the front, I don't think. That's it for now. Uh, yeah, well, we've got a little extra time, and I'd like to start by asking Stephen to elaborate a little bit more on your most recent comment that we won't need, like the schools will be operating in the background. How, what exactly are you visualizing there? So uh, there is an ongoing need for educational services, content, uh, applications, even you know the management of evaluation services, perhaps personal help desks or whatever. But what we don't need is all of this in the form of a classroom, especially when we're no longer going to physical classrooms. You know, I mean, no, there's going to be a big rush to go back to the classroom. And then and people will do that. And then once they're there, they'll be sitting there realizing, no, wait, this was stupid. Why did we do this? Let's go back online where it was convenient. And once we're back there, then we don't need the classroom structure, which means then we don't need the class structure. Uh, and we can just organize our learning on an as needed, where needed, when needed basis, which was the promise of this technology all along. Thanks. I want to ask Matthew and then Jason, if you'd like to have some follow-up comments on this. Uh, you know what? Uh, I think it's all been <laughs> said very well. I'm going to leave it at that, and uh, well, you can move on to Jason. <laughs> and Jason, you also said you wanted to elaborate from your perspective as a an instructor. So perhaps right, you yeah, I, I totally agree with Stephen. I think that mental model of the classroom needs to go, and um, it is it is all the world of this micro credentialing, and um, I I really do look forward to the evolution of this learning experience platforms where everything can be more unified um, and, and a whole ecology, right? Uh, I think from the teaching, the teacher's perspective, that will be ideal, so. Yeah, I just make one observation. Um, I always, whenever, before online learning became like pretty, you know, like even semi-ubiquitous, you know, with just a 10 to 20% penetration in higher ed and maybe about 40 to 50 in training. Um, I always observed that people hated the classroom until they had online learning. And then that's what they decided they wanted to hate. So, um, yes. <laughs> and then I think when we went all online as my parents used to tell me, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Um, I think people got sentimental for the classroom. Um, but I have a feeling that the snoring that was once prevalent there will come back. Anyway, we're gonna move on to our next segment. And I wanna to apologize to our panelists because this was supposed to be the first one. And I went one slide too far in my thing, but I think it actually worked out well starting with the LMSs, which is familiar. And so this next one is, and we'll start with you in the audience sharing your thoughts. How can we expect artificial intelligence and related, um, technologies really to affect and lay technologies like essay graders, I should say, to affect education after the pandemic. So we're talking about automated marking of essays, speech and visual recognition, 
personalized tutoring and anything in that what we call the AI family um, to expect affect education. And I'm thinking of not the AI as a teaching as a subject to be taught, but rather AI as a tool that we use. And so for this one, I'm going to start with Matthew. Would you like? I mean, sorry, I started with you last time. Take that back. I'm going to start with Jason this time. Apologize. Okay. Did you want me to jump in? Yep. Go jump in. Okay. Yeah, I think this is one area where accessibility can really be addressed. So my my experience was, um, you know, I've always taught in this sort of hybrid scenario where I have online and on-site students meeting um, sort of in a synchronous, semi-synchronous uh, modality. And uh, when we went fully virtual, I ran into problem with students who have disabilities that needed accommodation with, you know, perhaps like, um, you know, sign language or having a, a, an interpreter joining class at the same time and having to facilitate that sort of interactions, especially when we do in the breakout rooms uh, and that sort of um, scenarios. It makes me realize how important having this sort of, you know, AI family features, for example, like a voice recognition and um, subtitles, right, um, would, would be so helpful for, for both the instructors and the team. The, the learner to be able to follow the content without having to interrupt and having to um, get assistance from a third party and having to make all this additional arrangement. I think that's one area where technology can really assist and provide for a more robust and seamless um, learning experience for, for the on online environment. So that's my experience. Thank you. Stephen, you're next. And you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, I'm back again. All right, I I just posted a thing in the chat. It's a link to a section in my course, um, and it's uh, titled "All Applications of AI in Education." So modest goal there. Um, so that's what I think will happen. Um, but uh, something I want to key in on is uh, generative AI, that is to say uh, AI that is used to create things. And we've seen a lot in, especially in the last year or two years from uh, a set of algorithms known as GPT-3, um, which has been creating images, creating videos, creating music, creating writing, etc. And so right now we spend a lot of time creating learning resources. But in the not too distant future, certainly within 10 years, we'll have the capacity to use AI to create our learning resources. So what will happen is that it will uh, gather information from uh, the state of affairs in the world, to say it loosely, um, and then uh, based on the particular need, which again, it can detect based on context and personal information, assemble the content needed and then present it. So um, that's a lot closer than people think. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, people, well, as, as Jason was saying, we'll get very seamless, uh, you know, learning content and learning resources, but it also allows the rest of the educational infrastructure. And I'm here talking about universities, instructors, etc to focus in on those places where personal intervention will do the most good, rather than on very generic tasks like everybody writing textbooks, everybody preparing lectures, everybody creating modules, everybody marking tests. Thank you. Matthew. Very good. Uh, just let me start on accessibility. And just coincidentally, I posted a video on LinkedIn, I think last week, where I uh, discuss uh, some tools that can be used to check your accessibility of your resources. So you can find that, uh, find me on LinkedIn and find that video. Um, but Jason is right, accessibility is becoming more and more of an issue. And uh, it's particularly challenging for companies like mine, where we develop very advanced games and simulations to try to make those accessible. Um, it's much easier if you have a, a conventional uh, conventional content. But, you know, one of the things about AI I've noticed, uh, you know, it's this buzzword that people are using to win customers and <laughs> differentiate marketing and raise money. And some of the AI I've seen, you know, 
just it's not up to par. Uh, people are really overselling it. And uh, Stephen would know more about this than I do in, in the overall education space. But I, a lot of what I've seen in content creation and, uh, you know, the chat little chat bots when you visit a website, they're really selling AI. And I think it's really oversold. And, and a lot of times, um, I, obviously, there are some super advanced things going on. You know, just look at you know, driverless cars is probably a popular example we all know. And it really comes down to uh, automated decision making, you know, having a piece of software that's making decisions like a human might make decisions, whether it's collecting information and filtering that information and so on. But I think ultimately the biggest um, biggest transformations will come with uh, things like uh, student authentication, where, you know, how do you know it's your student taking the test and doing the work? Um, so authentication, proof of work in terms of the content experiences that are being developed, like in, in my business simulations that we developed, for example, uh, we can tell you that the student did work just by the fact of actually playing the game. And that's in, in itself a proof of work. Um, I think um, uh, Juan in the chat mentioned uh, adapting to uh, what the learner needs as they progress. But you know that also depends on us as designers to build products like that. And I can tell you that's very complicated to do, um, not only assess the skill, but then to to build more content to address a particular deficiency. Um, I think uh, assessment and credentialing is also where the biggest impacts are going to be. So automated assessments, like in our, and again, talking from my own personal experience in our simulations, we can actually monitor your decisions and your behavior. And, and through that uh, decision-making and behavior, we can assess your actual skill levels by demonstrated behavior. And I think you're gonna see a lot of uh, education moving towards that more uh, validated assessment and credentialing rather than the traditional, you know, multiple choice quizzing and testing and essay, which is really a very subjective uh, assessment. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. And before we turn it back to the panelists for some follow up, I'd like to get your opinion in the chat. Um, what do you, how do you think artificial intelligence is going to affect, be, affect us as a tool, not as a subject to teach, but as a tool? Um, so, it's out to you, all participants out there in cyberspace. Please share your thoughts in the chat. Um, while we're doing that, um, I just want to also thank Miriam Demanche for sharing Matthew's LinkedIn profile. So we've had a few people write, but I'm really curious to see the participants' um, observations on. Think of AI from get where we need it will require breakthrough in quantum computing. Yeah, definitely needs some more computing power for sure. Other thoughts about AI? Or what questions do you have about AI? When we hand over content curation to AI, how do we prevent bad faith players from gaming the system? Really good question. Concerned that AI approach might make us even more blind to things we don't know, feeding us what we think we want. Yeah, very similar comments coming in there. Um, other thoughts or concerns, questions about AI? Well, then I'm going to turn it back to our panelists. Um, any order, um, follow-up thoughts on this subject? I think uh, some of the content comments here are definitely uh, valid uh, in that, you know, but it's not just AI, it's even just education today. You know, whoever, create, whoever creates the content, you're basically trusting that they're providing the right type of information. Um, and so... So, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how we're going to end up credentialing the content in that way, but um, but you do have to consider that. And I, I noticed some comments about pattern recognition. Definitely, that's part of AI. But I think if you boil it down even further, pattern recognition is actually decision making because you're deciding what is a pattern and what isn't a pattern. Um, but yeah, it's it's a complex uh, it's a complex subject. But anyway, I'll, I'll pass it on to uh, Jason or Stephen. Jason, Stephen, you want to add anything? Yes, uh, Jason. sure. Just just from the chat, I think. I think um, it makes me think of ethics and a lot of uh, ethical considerations that um, the humans have to sort of work with um, the AI almost like a collaborator in, in a way that that will produce moral and desirable results, right? So not just the objective content themselves, but um, being able to use that in a way that is productive, meaningful, engaging, and also ethical. 
Thanks. And Stephen, I saw you wanted to say something too. A couple of quick things. Um, I've just put into chat a link to a page modestly titled All Ethical Issues of AI in Learning. Um, and uh, yeah, all, all the things that were brought up in the chat, valid points. Uh, I think it's important to distinguish between when AI works and when AI doesn't work. Uh, you know, people say, you know, for example, suppose it recommends something that it thinks I want as opposed to what I don't want, or as opposed to what I actually want. That's a case of AI not actually working, right? It's, it's not doing the job. So yeah, there's a whole class of issues there and there's no denying that, but imagine it works. Uh, we, we get a whole new class of issues, you know, for example, things like surveillance, facial recognition, privacy failures, assessment issues, lack of discretion, etc. There's this whole range of things. And I think that generally, and this is an approach that, that I've taken, these need to be thought of, not balanced, that's the wrong word, but thought of in the light of the benefits that AI provides. Take surveillance, really simple example. Well, it's not simple, but you know what I mean. Um, the, our quick reaction to say is uh, surveillance is bad. Um, but surveillance is what reveals things like the Panama Papers showing that all the rich people are hiding all of their income in Panama instead of paying taxes like the rest of us. Now, surely that wasn't bad, discovering that. Or surveillance was what allowed us to discover that torture was taking place in the Abu Ghraib oh. prison, uh, despite the uh, denials that any such thing was ever happening and would ever happen. Again, surveillance was probably a good thing. Uh, a lot of people have cameras around their homes, uh, not because they love surveillance, but because they feel they need the protection. So that's what's going to happen across the board with AI and analytics generally, right? There's going to be this mix of good effects and bad effects, and, and how we judge it is going to depend a lot on what our perspectives are. And just one final note, because it's convenient to say that uh, AI is going to need a lot more computing power than we have. It'll need quantum computing and all of that. Uh, I don't agree. I, I think AI is a lot closer. You, you look again what things like GPT-3 and other uh, models are doing, and uh, they, they truly are mind-boggling. Um, in you know, I've recorded transcripts for all my talks in this course. Uh, I just let Google AI do the uh, transcription. Now, is it perfect? No, uh, it makes mistakes. Um, mostly it inserts periods where there shouldn't be periods because of the way I talk, but it's really darn good. And it's real time. Uh, I can do it right on my phone here and, and generate real time captioning of whatever I'm saying. And in fact, uh, you know, here it is actually doing that right now as I speak, it's, it's captioning what I'm saying and, and getting it pretty well. So, and we already know because we use Google Translate all the time that AI translation works really well. We're not far uh, from being able to do a session like this and not worry about translation, uh, not worry about transcription, uh, nothing like that it'll all be handled by ai so um and that's a hard task transcription and translation really hard tasks recognizing whether somebody is properly welded a scene comparatively a lot easier and ai is already being used in many circumstances for quality assurance in the manufacturing process why wouldn't it be used in learning it makes no sense to think it wouldn't be Thank, Sorry, you. Really, thank you so much. I really appreciate the insights. I'll just say one thing about the uh, transcription service. The first time I dictated um, using voice, I had a 14 page run on sentence without any punctuation. So the fact that they could do punctuation and even paragraphs, major development in the world of uh, transcription. Let's move on to the next section. How can we expect learning analytics to evolve after the pandemic and how will they evolve? And I wanna start off by throwing this to you out in the audience. Um, 
how do you think um, learning analytics will evolve after the pandemic, pandemic and what's going to happen with them? How will they be used? Again, start off with the participants. How can we expect? If you have a question about learning analytics and you're not sure, ask because we've got three speakers here who can address those. Again, how can we expect learning analytics to evolve after the pandemic? Um, and if you have questions, so um, support learning pathways. Okay, great. Um, you have a question mark after that, Leonore, and perhaps you could type in the chat why you have a question mark. Do you want to find out how it can do that? Or you think it will do that? Or you're not sure if it'll do that? There'll be more data that's difficult to capture with in-person classes. Absolutely. Um, I want to get some confirmation. Okay, great. So one of the things we'll ask the speakers to confirm, can learning analytics support learning different learning pathways? Um, and then um, analytics will be about data points that include traditional evaluation results, plus behavioral metadata that can inform if there are changes in behavior. Anyone else want to weigh in? Integration of clicks with qualitative data. Interesting. All right, so I'm going to turn over to the panelists. I'm going to begin with um, Matthew this no, we start with Matthew. It's Stephen's turn this time. I have to remember. I apologize. I have no memory, apparently. Maybe uh, AI can help me with that, too. I have a feeling a hard drive and can do a lot of wonders on that one also. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean the short answer is it moves away from uh, measuring clicks and answers and sign-ons to actual data uh, about the practices and activities. Uh, it becomes less text-based and more everything-based. Um, it's using a variety of sensors and various input devices. Um, I've done experiments on uh, a brain uh, a brain surgery simulator where I have to use um, a torch to uh, wipe out cancer cells on the surface of the brain. A pretty delicate operation. Uh, uh, I learned I have a natural affinity to be a brain surgeon, uh, so I can do everything. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, my performance was assessed by the AI working alongside the simulator, so it could make suggestions to me. You know, uh, don't hold the thing so tight, etc. Um, you know, try moving closer to the boundary, things like that. That's what we're going to see. We're going to see more like actual practice focused analytics um, and that will happen in conjunction with a lot of our learning shifting away from you know content knowledge and theory based to practices skills aptitudes um, things like that uh, which is the subject of a lot of the micro credential stuff as well thank you matthew yes um before i answer that question i want to uh, just uh, I also mentioned uh, regarding transcription, there's a tool that I'll recommend. It's called Descript. It's a video editing tool. I'm going to see if I can paste it into the uh, chat here. And uh, what it does is it allows you to edit video with by actually using almost like a word text editor. The reason I mention it is I find it's really good at punctuation, much better than Google has been on punctuation. So I'll mention that tool in case you want to check it out. But it, in terms of um, analytics, I mean, analytics is what drives AI and everything else that we been talking about you know it's it's uh, not only delivering uh content but measuring assessing credentialing it's that whole process deliver measure assess credential and analytics is what ultimately helps us uh do all that and i think we're going to move uh, very much towards content being experiential learning based so that we do more authentic assessment and credentialing of performance uh you know one of the questions i often get asked from instruction i work with thousands of instructors around the world through our games and simulations and the question is always how, uh, can I see how much time my students are putting into this? And of course, time is important to know for planning purposes in terms of a curriculum, but I, uh, we need to get away from this concept of 
time being a measure of success or performance, right? You know, time is not the measure of those things. Time is a proof of work in some ways, but a lot of the things we're going to be doing in the, as the world evolves to more experiential learning, you can't measure with time. You have to measure with actual behavior and performance and skill and analytics ultimately uh, will do that for us. So it just comes down to measuring as much as possible. And then the other important thing is, uh, you know, the, the challenge I see and I work with many, many smart people from around the world. I find even smart people have trouble coming to correct conclusions about the data that they're seeing. So they'll see data, but they actually won't be able to interpret it properly and come to the right conclusions. And I think uh, in terms of where we're going to go with analytics, it's a big important part of that, that is not only collecting that data, but, but being able to assess it and come to proper conclusions about what the data is saying. And I think that's a big, a big part of where we need to go as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, sure. Just to piggyback on uh, Matthew's comment, I think the qualitative aspect of these interpretation of uh, performance is really important. And I, I'm probably the least qualified on this panel to, to speak to learning analytics because uh, I don't have the technical background in this. But um, at least for a teacher, I often also want to pay attention or even push back on. Um, equity issues and um, making sure we're not painting just one singular success story for students. And I, I wish really very much for um, analytics to be able to support the multiple learning pathways and labor-based sort of learning experience by the students as well. You know, what students themselves define as success and um, how can they achieve that? And how can we bring them to the table as well as we co-design this kind of learning analytics that will support them and not just the teacher's uh, requirements? Thanks. Um, maybe Stephen or Matthew can give us some practical examples of um, analytics, maybe either that are currently in use or about to come into use, because um, there was a question in the chat asking for that. If I can jump in, Stephen, if you don't mind, uh, just to pick up on what Jason was saying, you know, he's talking, uh, Jason's talking about a personalized assessment, right? Each student may have different goals. I'll give you a, a real world example. So we have a, a financial literacy, personal finance simulation, where you uh, learn about money and managing money by actually living your life in a simulated environment. So you make all the financial decisions you would normally make over 20 years of your life from getting jobs, whether you're going to go to school or college, further your education, uh, um, if you're going to do an emergency fund, if you can invest in various stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and so on. So the question becomes, when we're designing this simulation is, well, how do you measure success in personal finance? Because we all personally measure it very differently, right? Somebody wants to be a PhD, somebody wants to be a tradesperson. There's no right or wrong answer. So the way we've solved it in our simulation is we have goals, preset goals. A goal could be get a two-year degree, four-year degree, don't get a degree, get a job, hold a job for two years, you know, invest in the stock, and the instructor can actually choose the goal specific to each student or a group of students. And the students, when they're playing the simulation, they see the goals, it's part of the interface that they see, and they see when they're supposed to achieve each of the goals within the simulated environment. So one of the goals might be to have uh, $500 in an emergency fund within one year and hold that money for three years in your emergency fund. So that's a goal you would have to achieve, and you get scored as part of your grade on achieving that goal. So an individual student may have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 goals that they have to achieve and each student can be different. So that way it's very personalized for their students. So we're using the analytics not only to set the goals, but then measure when they've achieved those goals. So, thank you. Thank you. That's great. Stephen, do you have anything you want to, any examples you want to share? Yeah, if I can just uh, share my screen briefly. Um, yeah, let me okay. stop sharing mine. Hold on. Yeah. Go for it. Okay, now let's see if I remember how to do this. Uh, let's see, and there we go. Okay. All right, so what you're seeing here is an application called Feedly. Um, I know it's not an LMS, I'm sorry, uh, but it's what I used to learn. Um, and a lot of my learning comes from this. Um, it's uh, an RSS reader, uh, so, you know, it's old school technology, but what it has is an analytics AI analytics uh, application called Leo in it. And what Leo is, is something that 
I can train. Now, what the way it works is I have the list of all the feeds that I subscribe to, and here they are. These are categories on the left hand side. And I subscribe, I subscribe to about, I don't know, six, eight, 800 feeds, maybe a thousand. I'm not sure. I haven't counted them. Um, and I train Leo by telling Leo what I want to uh, follow. So here are, you know, I can track specific companies, products, etc. I don't use those at all. Uh, but here are my priorities. So what I've done here is um, I can classify things as, for example, AI ethics or cloud or ed tech uh, or social media. And uh, then I add things to that and Leo learns what I like. And then as new stuff comes in, in the list of feeds that I subscribe to, Leo makes recommendations. So when I sit down to read, uh, so here I have this priority. This is the stuff that's coming in from Leo. I can also get it uh, done in real time, the last thousand articles in the feed. Uh, so there's the breakdown of the different categories that it's found for me. But I, I start here and I read these and as you can see, um, it's asking, this one is not one that is uh, previously found, but it's asking, do I want to save it in the ethics board? Uh, if I go down here to the next one, oh, <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong button there. Uh, okay, so this one, my main Leo board is just plain ed tech generally. Uh, here, same thing, right? And it's just picking out of these things and helping me find the things that I'm really interested in. Um, right now, mostly Leo, but, but it would come up with some others. Here's one that it didn't classify you know, on conformity on campus. So it's not fitting any of my previously defined categories. But if I wanted to alter how Leo recognizes these categories, I can just pick one of these categories have Leo put it into the category, and then that will train the AI. Why is this important? Because the AI that's being trained is personal to me. Uh, it's not a centralized AI. Rather, it's a model that was developed by them, but the model now is sort of sent to me in its blank state, and I'm filling it in with the feeds that I I personally have selected and the stories that I'm personally personally selecting. Um, so it's my my judgment right now. It's very good. Um, I use it a lot as I'm uh, preparing my daily newsletter. I have other sources too. So uh, and actually, it's one of the things that I do is I bring other sources that Feedly hasn't considered. I bring them in. I use Pocket to save them, and then use RSS to harvest the Pocket. It, and then I put them into the AI ethics. So I train on data that Feedly wasn't even aware of. So I just thought I'd share that as a practical example of how AI helps me learn. And it helps me learn a lot. Uh, and, and to me, it's far more efficient than uh, pretty much any class would ever be. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing that. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on. And we have one more segment. What other areas of technology and research are emerging that will affect learning after the pandemic and how will they affect learning? I wanna start by asking you in the audience to share your thoughts in the chat. Again, what are other areas of technology, um, what other areas of technology and research are emerging that will affect learning after the pandemic and how will these affect learning? And we'll start with you all, share your thoughts in the chat. Augmented reality. Um, learning assistance like Alexa for learning. Thanks. Anyone else want to weigh in? Um, but it's much more sophisticated if you like the Yeah. Oh, that's another conversation. Um, anybody else? So sustainability will increase in, in importance. I agree with that, definitely. Um, 
So does any one of you want to go first on the panel sharing your thoughts on this subject? Because I've dictated in the past who gets to go first. I'll take a volunteer this time. Uh, I'll jump in. Uh, um, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, AR and VR, we're definitely headed in that direction. I think we still have a ways to go. VR, you know, because of the headset requirement is the challenge in education. Um, AR, I think, is a uh, lower hanging fruit because uh, we can use our phones to do that. But then you have to consider, you know, what are the experiences you're going to build with AR? I, I, I can see real applications for AR in, um, in kind of corporate or physical kind of environments. When you get into more academic, it becomes a little bit more fuzzy. Um, but I think that's, you know, that's an opportunity there. I, I, I'm in the, I, and I am, and I've been in the business of educational games and simulations for over 20 years. I think that's really where things are going to go is creating experiential learning opportunities for students. And so it's converting whatever we normally do now through, you know, lectures and books and videos and integrating that into a narrative experience and a game um, where, uh, you know, there's actual goals, objectives, customizable, assess, validate assessment, all those things. I think really that's where it's going to come down to experiential learning. So it's the transition of the curriculum to a more dynamic delivery, which maybe we'll talk about in the final segment uh, here as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, Jason, what's, what's your thought on this? Yeah, I, I definitely think that VR, AR, um, immersive sort of media would be the next step. Um, although I don't know how far we are along in that process and progress. Um, but certainly a uh, concern would be access, you know, how, how different students with, with different background, technical expertise, and even just material um, resources will be able to access those content if they, they were built in that sort of modality and how prepared um, faculty and instructors are to, to teach with those environment. Those are my, my concerns. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, well, my experience is with VR. I'm just looking for, well, it's very, uh, I was looking for the Oculus headset to wave around here because I have props, right? Um, but, but it's heavy, it's too small. It's, uh, um, so yeah, that's not quite there yet. Uh, I, I see a bigger future for AR than I do for VR. AR is augmented reality, so we're still living in the real world, but we get a display overlay of some sort, either with glasses or, you know, in the longer term future implants. That will be enormously useful. Uh, VR, where we actually immerse ourselves into a 3D environment, has its uses. Um, you know, especially for simulated environments where it's really not practical to work in a real environment, like uh, uh, flight training, flight simulator training, things like that. Um, you, you know, again, you need something better for, for your helmet for that to work really well. Uh, problem with that is it's really expensive to develop. Uh, once we get AI enabled VR development, um, that'll be a key development in that field. Um, as well, uh, where people want to go with, with VR especially, but also AR, is in um, multi-user scenarios. So like, it's not just you all alone in this environment. That's what made things like Second Life such a big hit, right? There were other people there. Um, I play a game called No Man's Sky, and, and, and there's, a, there's a VR version of it, but I, I don't like it. I like the, the plain 2D version of it. Uh, but again, there's other people there, and that makes it so cool. Um, so, but I don't, you know, I think there'll be this much of a segment that's this wide. Um, you know, uh, I put into the uh, chat area a link to a course I did in uh, 2019 called eLearning 3.0, which breaks out some of the major advances that I think will, will happen in the field. And I'm looking at things like graph-based analysis, cloud technologies, persistent identity. A lot of this will be based on blockchain technologies. A lot of this will be supported by AI technologies. And I think, you know, I think in the long-term future, 
those are the sorts of things to be watching for. Watch for um, distributed versions of currently centralized applications. Even the learning experience platform is the beginning of that. And, and watch for that to decentralize more and more and more so that your LXP really is nothing more than the links between all of these individual applications and your identity carrier and all of that. I think that's going to be more significant. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, the automated content creation assessment based on actual experience working in actual environments, those sorts of things. Uh, and ultimately, and this is what I say in the course, what it comes down to is an augmentation of personal agency and personal control over learning. I've been interested in personal learning environments for many years. I'm probably still oh, 10 years too soon for those. But uh, you know, as time goes by, as we get more secure distributed data standards, we're able to have more decentralized and therefore more personal learning applications. Thanks. Well, we're running towards the end. And so I'd like to ask each of our presenters to give a closing statement. And they've got one minute um, to present. Um, we'll start with Matthew. Thanks all. So I'm gonna go back to the original question you started this, uh, the session with, and that is, you know, how has the pandemic changed? And I actually wrote about this before the pandemic, and it was the concept of what happens when uh, all of our post-secondary institutions move their content online, and now we have you know, probably over 10,000 around the world that have done that. What happens when you move those courses online and they all look the same, which I think is exactly where we are today. And now students have, have a choice of what they're, you know, whether they want to take on, uh, online or in class, even when they're physically present. You know, you'll notice in the, some of the trends, students are, are still choosing to take the online course even when they're on campus because of scheduling or personal preference or whatever it may be. So now you have you know, 10,000 plus institutions uh, offering the same courses that look the same online. So how do you differentiate? And what's been happening is that uh, educational institutions post-secondary have lost their number one competitive advantage their number one competitive differentiator and that is geography so if you look at institutions over the last hundred years most of them pull in students from their local region and when you're moving online that competitive advantage is almost wiped out not completely wiped out but it's almost wiped out now the prestigious brands uh, you know for whatever reason why they're prestigious they're gonna, they're going to do okay you know people are going to pick out those prestigious brands but if you're the, in part of that other 99 percent how are you going to differentiate your content? And I'm sure no one wants to differentiate on price because that's a race to the bottom. So ultimately, you have to differentiate on curriculum. How do you provide a better experience for students, no matter where they are on campus, off campus, wherever they are? How do you provide a better experience? And the only way you can provide a better experience is to improve the delivery of the curriculum. So Thank instead you. of, you know, that's, I think that's really the, the, my primary message. Thanks, all. Thank you so much. Jason, you're next. Sure, that, that's a tough statement to follow. I'm not sure if I have any more insightful comments to offer, but I, I do agree um, that as we look to the future, um, differentiating ourselves is important. Um, understanding student needs and being able to work from the ground up, I think it's part of the, the work that we need to do now and leverage you know, all the affordances of technologies that we have at our disposal um, without undermining um, accessibility, equity, social justice issues. I think those are important uh, things to pay attention to. Thank you. And finally, but definitely not least, Stephen. So I don't think the uh, business advantage for universities is geography. I think the business advantage for universities is credentialing. Um, you know, a lot of people go just for the degree and so they can get the degree and then enter into the job market. Um, that's a long roundabout way to get to where you want to go. And a lot of people will find that online learning is a much shorter route to the same end. Sure, they won't get the degree, but if you don't need the degree anymore, which you won't with automated assessment, then you get the job right away. Or as I like to say in slogan form, the credential of the future is a job offer. Um, with respect to uh, 
the pandemic. Here's my generic prediction. Uh, in the year, assuming the pandemic ends, <laughs> uh, in the year or so following the pandemic, um, everybody will rush back to where it is, where it was, because must nostalgic, right? And then, as I sort of suggested earlier on, they'll be back to where they were, and they'll be going, "Why are we here? This is stupid." And they'll begin to look for those things in online learning and, and online work generally that worked and there were a lot of things i really enjoy the lack of a commute uh, for example um related to this and and i think this is probably my most important observation from time to time throughout this discussion people have said things like students prefer to be back in class or students like to do such and such right and we often talk as though the clients that we serve are quote unquote students. Now it's a very particular market segment. Uh, it's generally young, uh, it's generally affluent, um, and it's generally privileged. Um, what we discovered, I mean, we discovered two things in the pandemic. First of all, when the pandemic hit and we all moved online in a hurry, we lost touch with a lot of people who are at risk. Um, you know, um, in, in, you know, like in some countries, millions of students just disappeared. I'm, I'm talking about lower grades here, right? So we saw right away that that was a problem. But now as we go back, we're also going to find that in the move back to physical, we're going to lose a whole bunch of people people who were disabled, people who were geographically challenged, uh, people who couldn't make the time or didn't have the money. Um, you know, um, Matthew, I think, said, no one wants to differentiate on price. Well, that's fine for the students who are already there, but the vast majority of people, not there. You know, and Canada is one of the best countries in the world for access to education. But still, there is a significant population that could not possibly afford to go to university. Uh, and the situation is much worse south of the border and in other places. So uh, I think that if I had to pick one long term uh, impact of the pandemic, it will be to redefine who our clients are moving away from students as specially selected tuition paying advantage person to students as anybody in society because universities will need to learn they serve all of society and not just the most privileged section of it. Thank you very, very much. I want to thank all three of our panelists, Matthew Giorgio, Jason Tam, and Stephen Downs for really enlightening us and uh, taking us beyond way beyond the obvious to some deeper insights into the, uh, the technology and the long-term impacts of the uh, pandemic. I also wanna thank the audience for some like really amazing observations at your end. Um, before I go, I just wanna make you aware of a number of CNIE related things um, because in addition to today's presentation, we have a number of other things coming up. First, January 15th and 18th are really important dates. The 15th proposals for our next conference um, are due. Um, and that's going to be at, um, and, though, and so I'll be sending a follow-up email that has the link to our call for proposals. It's also on our website. Um, next, on the 18th of January, the entries are due for our awards competition. And we have a showcase presentation, another event like this. There's an RSVP link in there. There's also the link in the handout that I'll be sending later today with the link to the awards. And then we have other events coming up the 15th of February and the 15th of March. We have a showcase presentation the February the 15th. March 15th, we have a presentation. Um, we have a really cool presenter, but I don't have the description and title yet. So I'm going to wait to share those with you um, in the new year. And then um, the next thing on our calendar is the second through the fourth of May when we have our virtual conference. So I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, I want to once again thank our wonderful, wonderful presenters and have a wonderful, wonderful day. It's been great to see everyone here. Thank you. Stop the share. I'm going to stop recording.